Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here uh, at the Lisbon Wade Seminar. And I would like to thank James Kennedy and Hugo Tavares for their kind invitation to participate in this series. So I'm going to talk about the ganglia dominion sovereign inequalities uh, in, in the whole space and the whole RN and also in bounded domains. I'm sorry. And this is joint work with uh, Soledad Ben Guria. She's from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Cristobal Vallejos. He used to be at my university, but he is now at Penn State University, and Hanne Vandenbosch from the University of Chile. Uh, so di different parts are with different people. And the summary is the following. I'm going to, to give a short overview of the Gagliardo Nirenberg Solomon inequalities. And then I'm going to talk about uh, their counterparts uh, with different boundary conditions, directly boundary conditions first, Neumann boundary conditions later. And, and, but they are going to share some part of the same phenomenon, which is when, when you, you are in a bounded domain, we are going to have concentration. And the concentration, as, as you all know, in the case of Dirichlet boundary conditions, is going to be in, in the interior point. And in the case of Neumann boundary condition, it's nice. It's, it occurs uh, at the boundary. And it, because of, it occurs at the boundary, then there are uh, certain things that are very special about the geometry of the boundary. So I'm going to start with an overview, which is very short and probably should be a, a, a course, but I'm going to give you a few transparencies. So the, the first inequality that we all learn at the beginning is the sublim inequality, which is stated there and relates the, the Q norm of U and the P norm of the gradient of U with Q and, and P are related to that expression here and which involves obviously the dimension. And that was proven by Sobolev in 1938. And the best constants for this, for this inequality are unknown and they, are, they were proven by Oban and Talenti and they are given by this expression in terms of gamma functions. And the minimizers are given by this expression. And a particular case I'm going to mention later was proven in, already in 1882. And in the particular case of P equal two, the, the, this constant C is, is given by this expression for all dimensions bigger than two. Uh, the Gagliano Nirenberg, a special class of Gagliano Nirenberg, the Gagliano Nirenberg inequality is a huge family. And what I'm giving here at the, at the, at the top of the page is a particular uh, a subclass of Gagliano Nirenberg inequalities. And they, they relate the L, LQ norm of U with the L, L, LP norm of the gradient of U and the R, uh, R norm of U. And, and the connection here between the, the parameters Q, P, and the dimension N, are, it's expressed in this uh, linear combination of the reciprocal of, the, of, the, of these things. And here P runs from one to N, and the parameter alpha here in, the, in this uh, convex combination that appears in the exponents, it runs from zero to one. And in, in the particular case, when alpha is equal to one here, you see that this term is just one, and then you recover the sovereign inequality. So the sovereign inequality is a particular case with alpha equal one of the, of the Gagliano Nirenberg inequality. And this year, uh, a few months ago, that uh, it appeared a very nice paper by Firenze and co-workers, which is published in, in, in the size script for analysis and, 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 and its applications in 2021. And they have a very nice history of the Gagliano Nirenberg inequalities and also some uh, simple proofs of, of the inequality. And the, 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 the general Gagliano Nirenberg inequalities were introduced in the International Congress of Mathematicians in 58 where Gagliardo and Nirenberg were, were invited to participate in uh, to give a short communication. And the, so they gave these talks in the ICN of, of 58 in Edinburgh. Edinburgh. And the, the, the first publications were, were, were given by this. And there is a, an error here. This, this should be 59 too. So there is a typo, 1959. And in one dimension, there were previous inequalities by Alamar in 1897 and Nagy in 1941. And also present in the ICM in Edinburgh 
uh, was Olga Ladishinskaya, and she pr proved special. She proved a special case of the Galileo Nirman inequalities for q equal four and p equal n equal two, and alpha equal a half. And this is the the inequality that she she treated. And she needed that inequality for her famous paper on the, trying to prove the, the solutions in the large of the boundary problem for the navier Stokes equation in dimension two. And so that 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 was really the first uh, uh, a special case of Galileo Nirenberg inequality. And also there are some other cases which are stated here, and they are all known as Ladishinskaya's inequality. And, and one of the concerns for, of people in the in the who study Galileo Nirenberg inequality is the uh, to get sharp constants, and sharp constants are known in very in a few special cases. Uh, one of the the easiest case is the one in, in dimension one, which I need. I, I I'm going to mention it later too. And for for that case, uh, the the constant is known is uh, four over pi square here. And also in the dimension three, as I said before, when alpha equal one, you are back in the Sobolev case, and we know the Sobolev constant, the sharp constant uh, already. And the, the other special case, which includes case two, is the case of dimension B equal to three with P equal to two, and this family of Q equal to T and R equal to T plus one, when T runs from one to N over N minus two. And that case, covers the case two, uh, the case two is special case of the Nismus general case, and that was proven by Manuel Del Pino and Jan Dolbo in 2002. And again, the, 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 what is common in between case two and three is that the minimizers, the optimizers are given by this expression here, which is very well known. In all the other cases, the sharp constants are not known, but they are very good estimates, as I will mention here. Uh, for my own interest, the, I, I am interested in a particular subclass of the of the Galileo Nirenberg inequalities that I expressed before, and so the subclass is given by this condition here and the sharp constant. I'm going to denote them by k of rho n, and here uh, uh, q the 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 q norm, the q that appears in this norm here is given by rho plus two. P is equal to R is equal to two, and alpha, the, the, the constant that appears in the convex combination here is given in terms of rho by this quantity. And here, the so the, all these things are given in terms of one parameter, rho, and this parameter rho runs from zero, not from, from zero to rho naught. Rho naught is the maximum here, and it's given by four over n minus two, where n is the dimension of the space. And it, that, that condition here, the maximum is for all dimensions bigger equal to three. And in the case of dimension one and two, the rho node is equal to infinity. And, and what this expression here is what characterizes the embedding of H1 in L rho plus two. And not only I'm going to restrict myself to this subclass of Galileo nirenberg inequalities, but also we're going to consider special rho, which is in this, this interval, but it's just one special case, which is four over n, where n is the dimension of the space. And my interest on that be becomes from the lip inequalities. And as I said before, the sharp constants are only known in special cases when n is equal to one and rho is equal to four, if we express it in, in this language. And for dimensions bigger equal to three, when rho is equal to rho naught, which is four over n minus two. So we only know the sharp constants in that case. And otherwise, the best estimates today for K, for in general, for this in a subclass of Galileo nirenberg inequality, were obtained by Sharif Nasibov in 1989, already a long time ago. And I am going to say later, in connection with the Lipton inequalities, why I'm interested only in this class. So uh, if you restrict to rho equal 4 of n, uh, the sharp constant is given by this problem. I mean, you take the infimum where u belongs to H1, of course, and uh, in the infimum of this quotient here. And as I said before, g of one is pi square over four. And in the case when n is equal to two, uh, in this particular case of n equal to two of this sort of, uh, of this family is precisely the case of 
considered by Olga Ladishinskaya. And in that case, for, for the Ladishinskaya inequality, the sharp constants are not known. And in general, this is not known for any n different from one. And I'm going to say a few words about the sharp constant. This is, uh, there's a little bit of messy connections here, but uh, the, the Nassimov estimates were based on a previous result by Michael Weinstein on his PhD thesis. He, Michael Weinstein, when he did his PhD, he found the connection between the gagliardo nirenberg optimizers and the long-time behavior of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation that was published in Communications and Mathematical Physics in, in, 90, in 89, sorry, in, in, in 83. And the, the, the connection was used then by Sharif Nasibo to obtain the best uh, bounds, like here there is a typo, not bonus, the, the best bounds today. And the, 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 the Nasibo bounds are called K of N of rho N, and this constant here are the sharp constant for the gagliardo nirenberg inequality. And they are expressed in terms of geometry, in terms of the, the volume of the N minus one sphere, the beta function here, and the, the other thing that appears here is the, the babenko Wegner uh, constant here, which are the best constant for the house of Yang inequality. So KBB are the best constant for the house of Yang inequality, and they were proven independently by Babenko and, and, and Wegner. That's why they call BB here. And they are given, and this is sharp, and they are given explicit in this term. Uh, as I and as, as as I said before, the best constant for the Galileo nirenberg inequality are uh, bigger equal than this Nassibo uh, value here, which exp is expressed in terms of, of in terms of the Nassibo constant here. G of n is given by that expression. And more recently, the last decade, I mean, starting from, from the beginning of the, uh, and, uh, 10 years ago, uh, people started using uh, the projection of the Fourier transform and the high and low energy components inspired by a method uh, introduced by Roman. And it's very well, it's very much used in, 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 in the lip uh, community. And if you use that, then there is a much easier bound, which is not not as sharp as the one of, uh, I mean, for for this constant g of n. So it's not as sharp as the as the one obtained by Nasibo, but it's much simpler in terms of the quantities that enter here, and and the and the 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 the, the, the estimates that you get for these things are given explicit in terms of n. And, the, and also in terms of the volume of the n minus one sphere. So, uh, so uh, I'm not going to mention uh, more on that. I have a table for the values. So here uh, are the numerical values in dimensions from one to five. And <clears throat> in the first column here <clears throat> is the Nassibo estimate. The second column is the one that you obtain by the Romans method. And the third column is the, the this is uh, for n equal one, this is sharp, 2.4674 is just pi square over four. And the others, we obtain them <clears throat> numerically by solving the, the Euler Lagrange equation for the minimizer. And you see the, the very good agreement between the Nassibo thing and the, and, and the sharp values, I mean, the, the numerical values. And I'm going to say a few words of motivation for the from the community that I work on on the Lipton inequalities. Why the, this particular uh, subclass of gagliardo uh, nirenberg inequality is important uh, in, in this context. So, uh, for, if you have the Schrödinger operator in the whole domain with the potential in the whole Rn with potential a negative potential minus V. V here is positive. And you call minus e the, the corresponding eigenvalues. You have a set of discrete eigenvalues below the continuum, and the Lipton inequalities state this connection between the sum of powers of the absolute values of the eigenvalues related to the negative part of the potential to be. 
And there is a very a huge literature on the subject. There is a, now a book by Rupert Frank and Ari Laptev on that thing. And we know that for n equal one, they hold for gamma, gamma bigger equal to a half. For n equal two, they hold for gamma bigger than zero. The special case gamma equal to zero, which is the number of eigenvalues, is the famous uh, inequality obtained by Rosenblum, Schrickel, and Lieb. And I, I see that Gregory is here. So, uh, so that that's a very uh, that's a very famous case subclass a particular case of this inequality, and for dimension bigger or equal to three, they are they hold for gamma bigger. Sorry, the case of uh, the the Rosenblum Schrickel Lieb inequality is a, is a for n dimension bigger or equal to three when gamma is equal to zero. In dimension two, they only hold for gamma bigger than zero. And the the sharp constant are known for n equal one and gamma equal to half, and for any n bigger or equal to one as long as gamma is bigger or equal to three half. And it, it has been conjectured, and there, there are lots of new results about that conjecture in recent years, that when gamma, when the exponent here is less than three half, when we don't know the, the sharp values, the L gamma of n, the, the best constant for the lip inequalities should be obtained when the potential V has only one uh, eigenvalue. And that's why we call L1 of gamma n. So that the conjecture says that the constant one would get only if V has only one bound state. And in that case, you can solve it exactly. And that was solved by Joseph Keller in 1961. And you can find the sharp, if the potential V has only one eigenvalue, it's an easy problem to solve. And the, the, the best constants are given by that expression where K1 of gamma is that. And rho is given by that quantity here. And when uh, when gamma is equal to one, which is the more natural case, when you are connecting the the sum of the negative eigenvalues, the energies, and then uh, in that case this term disappears, and rho is equal to four over n. And that's the reason which, that I was mentioning before that I was only interested in the case of rho equal four over n, which is for me the most important case. And recently, I mean, this year, last year, and this, this, this is a paper that is going to appear, this has been accepted in communication mathematical physics by Robert Frank and Gontier and Levine. Uh, they proved that the deep thin conjecture in general is false, and it fails at least when the gamma, when the exponent of the powers of the eigenvalues is, is bigger than the maximum of, of this quantity here in particular. Uh, when dimension is two or bigger, it fails when gamma is bigger than zero. So these are very recent uh, uh, results on the lip tearing inequality. Okay, so I'm going to go to the second part now. Uh, I'm going to, to uh, go to the counterparts on bounded domain. And in particular, I'm going to mention two cases, the Dirichlet boundary conditions and the domains, bounded domains and the, the corresponding Euler equations with Dirichlet boundary conditions and also with Neumann by boundary conditions. So I'm going to start with Dirichlet boundary condition first. And I'm going to mention a very important problem, which is the precision Nierenberg problem. And so uh, if, you, if you consider the case of the sublim inequality when P is equal to two, and Q is equal to two N over N minus two. I mean, perhaps the, the best known case is dimension three and the uh, exponent Q is six. So you consider the infimum of this quantity here. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, the, the sharp constant is given by this quantity in terms of gamma functions. The minimizers are given by this quantity. Uh, and and, and it, it, this is for the, for the case in the whole R, Rn. And you can consider the same quantity, the same problem, in, take the infimum of this thing, but not in the whole Rn, but in a bounded domain with directly boundary conditions. So you can see, instead of considering this general problem, minimizing uh, over all functions u that <coughs> has gradient u in L2 and u in Lq, you minimize this quantity here with u in H01. So you impose directly boundary conditions. And we all know that there are no uh, minimizers for that thing. You have concentration. So the minimizers for this, uh, for the problem in Rn, you can, there is invariance under scaling and you can concentrate them in an interior point. And these are approximate minimizers. 
So we, we know that there are no minimizers in the case of, of the bounded domain with vertical boundary condition. Uh, but uh, using concentration compactness, and the way I use concentration compactness is using the famous Bresis compactness lemma of 1982. If, 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 if S of N of omega is less, strictly less than S of N, then there is a minimizer of, uh, of this quantity. And, and one can prove using the relic Pohosayev identity, which is a virial theorem. I mean, variance under scaling. So the relic Pohosayev, uh, for me, it's just a, 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 a virial theorem. You can use the Adamar approach for that. And you can prove that if omega is a star shape, then there is no non-trivial solution for this quantity here. And this, this fact that when you have a star, I mean, a, a one particular case of star shaped domain is the sphere. And for the sphere, uh, the fact that you don't have solutions of, the, of, of this equation here, of the Euler equation for the Sobolev problem, that was uh, noticed by Arthur Schuster in 1882 in connection with the lane ending equation. So, and, and he, he introduce the, the typical minimizers that we know today. And so I, I am the only person in the world that call them Schuster functions, but anyway, I wanted to, to bring them. In. So in, in 1983, Brasis said, I mean, we know that in the case of a bounded domain, there are no solutions for, with directly bounded conditions, there are no solutions for this thing. And Brasis Nirenberg, they, in 1983, they say, well, what about if we introduce a linear perturbation to the original problem? And instead, instead of considering uh, this problem with lambda equals zero, which is the original problem, the oil the, the oil equation for the Sobolev thing, they, they said in, let's introduce a, a linear perturbation, the lambda u here. And, and they asked themselves, uh, what is the range of values of lambda for which there is a solution here of this, uh, a positive solution of this problem here? Uh, satisfying boundary conditions in a, uh, directly boundary conditions on a bounded smooth domain. And uh, so what is the, 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 the range of values? And they, they, they prove that if lambda is, of course, has to be bigger than zero because for lambda equals zero, we, don't, we know there are no solution. If lambda is between zero and lambda one, uh, where lambda one is the first directly eigenvalue, then there are there are so positive solutions. If sorry, if in dimension any bigger equal to four, there are solutions in in this range where lambda one is the first Dirichlet eigenvalue. And in the case of n equal three, which is sort of like a critical dimension for this problem, they prove that there is a gap that you don't have solution uh, close to zero, but they start uh, with mu strictly bigger than zero. And they prove that if lambda is between mu and lambda one, so there are two spectral parameters, the first Dirichlet eigenvalue and this mu, then uh, the nonlinear, this nonlinear problem has a positive solution. And in the particular case, when omega is the ball, they obtain the sharp value of mu, which is a, a quarter of the first direct ligand value for the ball. So uh, this is the famous uh, Brasis Nirenberg uh, problem, and there has been a huge literature on the subject in the last 30 years about that. Yeah, in, in the part, when, <clears throat> for positive radial solution, if you consider radial solution, so if you consider the case of the ball, and then the, the equation that you had before, this equation, when you are in a ball, reduces to an ODE equation. And you can, the ODE equation makes sense even if n is not a, an integer. Of course, when you are in the general case, it only makes sense when n is an integer, which is the dimension of the problem. And so precisely this problem, and in that case, when you have a ball and you consider the radial equations, uh, the, this problem was considered when the parameter, now n is a parameter, it's no longer the dimension. And when n runs from two to four, this was considered by Gianelli in 99. And he proved that uh, there, there is a positive solution to the ODE when the square root of lambda is between these two zeros of Bessel functions. J, J and nu k is the kth positive zero of the Bessel function. So there are two uh, spectral parameters. This, this, in fact, the, this one here is just the lambda one uh, is, is the first Dirichlet eigenvalue. 
And this is the equivalent of the mu problem of the Brazilian vaccine. So they, he proved, and then he proved that when lambda runs between these two values, then there is a positive solution. And there is a gap, and the gap now is not lambda one over four, but it's connected to that. And in, in the picture here, I, I have drawn a square root of lambda in, in, in terms of the parameter, and then it's a continuous parameter now. In the particular case, when n is an integer, you have dimension three here, uh, and then you have dimension two and dimension four. And in dimension three here, uh, you, uh, I mean, in this picture, in the shaded region, we have existence of solutions. The upper line, which is not straight line, I mean, uh, it's the series of vessel function that I pointed before. Then this is the first Dirichlet eigenvalue. And then this is the mu parameter that appears here. And in this case, we have the Brazil's Nuremberg thing. And uh, lambda goes from pi square to pi square over four, which is precisely the Brazil's Nuremberg thing. And now, uh, instead of considering that, one, I mean, this is, this is the, the Brazil's Nuremberg thing is very nice because one can prove sharp uh, division, sharp separation here between existence, existence is in the shaded region and non-existence. To prove non-existence in the upper part is very easy. You multiply by the first Dirichlet eigen function to the equation and you massage it a little bit and then you get the non-existence. In the, in the lower part, you have to use a refined version of the relic pokosayev inequality. So in this part, you use relic pokosayev here, you use multiplication by the first Dirichlet eigen function. And you can treat the, a more general case. I mean, it's very nice that there is a sharp separation here. You have non-existent and existent, and the estimate for this boundary is sharp. You cross the boundary and then you have non-existent. You cross the boundary, you have non-existent here. And that's very nice. And it, it's important to understand why you have the sharp transition. And so that's why I consider this problem, which is a more general problem than the one considered by, in, in a sense, it's a more general problem than the one considered by Brazil and Nuremberg, but only if, if for the case of, of, of the ODE. So if, in, I mean, for the case of the Brazil Nuremberg problem, when you are in a ball, uh, you obtain a, an ODE, which is of this form. And in that case, for the Brazil Nuremberg case, this functions A of X is just X, and a prime is one. So this is the radial part of the Laplacian. Is minus, this is minus Laplacian u, and this is one over r. And you can consider also in the problem in, in the sphere. And in the, in the case of you have a geodesic ball in the sphere, a of x is sine x. And you can consider a geodesic ball in the hyperbolic space. And in that case, a of x is, is sinh of x. And so, and these three cases have been considered by people. In the case of the sphere, it was considered by, by myself and Catherine Bandley. In the case of the uh, hyperbolic space, it was considered by a student of Catherine Bandley, Silk Stapelkam. And in, in, but you can also try to consider in general, don't specify A in particular. So A different from X, sine X or sinh X but you can consider a whole class of phase for which you can consider this problem. And, and we consider the problem when uh, the function A is C3 and sufficiently smooth. Uh, the second derivative of A at the origin is zero and the uh, A is increasing and the limit of A of X over X is one when X goes to zero. You can check that in all the three known cases for the for the case of a, of, a, of a domain in the in the Euclidean in the in the Euclidean case, a of x is r. You can check that all these things are satisfied. In the case of the sphere, it's also satisfied. Uh, in, as long as you are in in the hemisphere, if you are beyond the hemisphere, these things are not hold, don't, they don't hold. And in the hyperbolic case, they hold in general. Uh, and so now you can consider, uh, try to generalize the case of the Janelli problem and try to see what is the range of values for which lambda, for which you have a positive solution on this problem. And here, and, and, and what we're going to prove is that, what we proved in fact, is that if lambda is between these two spectral parameters, mu one and lambda one, then there is a, a solution to this problem. 
And lambda one is the first I did the eigenvalue of this problem. So when you you neglect this term, so you have this quantity here, and with this boundary condition. And mu one is the same. And the, the nice thing is that you can characterize mu one with the same uh, ODE, the, the, the same expression here. But the only difference is the uh, boundary conditions. For lambda one, for the first Dirichlet eigenvalue, you have this boundary condition. For mu one, it is this different boundary condition. So uh, we, we look at mu one and lambda one as, <coughs> as spectral parameters, as eigenvalues of a linear equation with two different set of boundary conditions at, at this in zero. At R, we all, all, always impose directly boundary condition. And uh, what we prove is that there is no possible solution if lambda is bigger or equal to lambda one. This is the standard case. If you are above the, the, the Dirichlet eigenvalue, then you don't have solutions. And it also, if you are below mu one, as I said before, and bigger than n star, and you can characterize this, I, we call this n star. I don't know why we call it star, but you can characterize this value here uh, uh, in terms of the uh, the function that characterizes the ODE, the 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 operator here in terms of this a. And so, and, and in the particular case when a is the when when we're in the Euclidean case on the sphere, it's very, in, in the case of a geodesic sphere, it's a geodesic ball in the sphere and also a geodesic ball in the hyperbolic space, we recover all the results that are obtained by people. And also you can prove uniqueness in the case where you have a solution, we can prove uniqueness is assuming that A satisfies this condition, this convective, this weird condition here. And I'm going to mention a couple of words only on how would you prove that. Uh, uh, so in order to prove the, ex the existence of solutions, you can consider this, uh, this quotient here, this variational principle here, and then you use concentration compactness. So if you, if you can prove that you have a, an estimate of, uh, for this quantity here uh, that, that is below the, the is below the sovereign constant for the problem uh, using the concentration compactness or the precise, the deep precise lemma, then you can prove existence of solution. And in order to, pro to, to prove the, that you are below the, the, the sovereign constant, you always use uh, 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 the, what I call the Schuster function. Nobody calls them Schuster function. But the Schuster function, they don't satisfy the boundary conditions. So you multiply them by this uh, modifier here, by this uh, cutoff function. So five is a very nice smooth function that satisfies the Dirichlet boundary condition. So, uh, and, and then this depends on this epsilon. In order to allow for concentration, you take epsilon going, going to zero, and then your functions are going to be very concentrated uh, around a, an interior point. So if you can prove using the concentration compactness here, if you can use the precise precise lemma, if Q is less than SM, then you can you have existence of solution. And, and that's what you do. You 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 have to set up, you have to consider this as trial functions for, for using concentration compactness. You have to allow epsilon to be small enough in, in the sense that the quotient goes be, below the directly the the, the solar the 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 sharp value for the solar quotient and so you get uh, to first order when epsilon is, is zero you get the solar constant and then you have a correction here and t of five is a linear op is a quadratic form is given by this quantity here and so uh, in order to prove existence you have to uh, characterize the, the range of values lambda for which this quadratic form is less than zero. And, and, and that occurs when lambda is bigger, is smaller than mu one. So bigger than mu one, you have a proof existence. And the only equation for the quadratic form is precisely what I told you before. Okay, so that's the typical, I'm not going to go into more details, but that's a typical method you use to prove the existence of solution. And in order to prove the non-existent, you always use the virial theorem, which is the relic Pohosai argument. 
And for the relic Pujosa environment, you get a, using the invariance and the scaling, you get a video theorem, which is of this form here. And so you have a problem, at, a constant at the boundary connected with integrals in the interior. And you have a quadratic form in U square and also P, uh, this nonlinear uh, expression in the interior. And A and B are messy quantities here. So A is given by this quantity here. Uh, G is a trial function. So you have, for any G that satisfies uh, directly boundary conditions at the extreme and sufficiently smooth, you have, in general, for all these problems, for all the precision neural problems, you get uh, a, a is a, 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 a expression that depends on the third derivatives of the trial function here. And it looks very terrible. And B is, is simpler. B is uh, given in terms of just G prime and uh, G and G prime. So in order to prove a contradiction here, to prove non-existence, to use the real theorem in order to prove, in order to prove non-existence, and you have to, to prove at the same time you have a, a G, you choose a particular G for, what, for which this is zero, and at the same time B is negative. And since the, the term in the boundary is positive, you get a contradiction. So that's a scheme, the general scheme. And in all the cases that I know, this was given a, a, a using particular a special functions. Uh, but the, the nice thing that you can do is that you can use, a, a, you, you don't need to use a special function, you need to, 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 you, you need to use the solution to the spectral problems that I told you before. And so uh, the goal, the goal, I mean, to have a, an expression A, um, to choose a, a, a trial function G for which A is zero and B is negative, you reach it by always in all the cases by uh, expressing the trial function in terms of the solution to the spectral, the linear spectral problems in this way. I'm not going to, to do it in general here, but this is always the case. And you, you insert it in that and you have to work a little bit hard and you prove that for, for this choice of G, even if you have a third order equation for A equals zero, then uh, you have A equals zero and B less than zero. And then you are done. And the proof on uniqueness is the use standard is result of Kong and Lee, but I'm not going to mention. Okay, so now I'm going to say a few words about the Neumann boundary conditions, which are uh, special in the sense that uh, all the, the phenomenon, the concentration doesn't occur on the boundary, sorry, on in the interior, but it occurs in the boundary. So we, con we consider uh, the Bresis Nirnberg problem. And, 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 but instead of considering the whole Rn, we consider it in, in a bounded domain of omega. And here we don't have directly bounded conditions. So in order for this to make sense, we subtract the average of u in the domain. So here u belongs to w11 and nu of omega is the average. So it's just this, this expression. And it's a, the same as a, having free bounded conditions. So in, in, you can set the average to be zero and impose free boundary con uh, Neumann conditions. And it, it, for, for reasons that, I mean, for reasons that uh, also come from the Lipton inequalities, uh, one is one uh, uh, the most interesting case for, for studying this thing is the uh, uh, cubes. So uh, omega is uh, this, the, the zero one N is the N, N cube of light of size of side one. And for that particular case, we say this quantity here, when omega is the cube, we call it G of the cube. And the problem is, uh, when do you have, uh, what, what can you say about the existence of minimizers for this quantity here? And the main result that uh, we have is that if the domain is smooth enough, and smooth enough means C3 at least, uh, also, uh, and then in dimension B or equal to two, then we can prove that there are minimizers. So if the, if the, the, if the domain is, is smooth, you can always have a minimizer in the case where you have a bounded domain. And it, when the, the domain is not smooth, then there are peculiar things happen. In particular, you can have in dimension two, you have rectangles and they have corners and they are not C3 or in dimension bigger than be equal to 
to two, then we can consider hypercubes, etc. And we can prove, uh, and, and so when you don't have a smoothness, you can prove that in, in some, the, the existence or non-existence depends on, uh, on, on different things. We can prove that in dimension n bigger than or equal to 10, and you always have minimizers in the hypercube. And also, if, the, if you have in dimension two, if you have a rectangle, which is sufficiently elongated, so uh, then you also have solution, uh, existence of solution. And so you, we have existence of solution in, in smooth domain and also in domains with corners in for, sufficient, for special cases. But the interesting thing is that if you have corners, like an exhaustless rectangular triangle, you have non-existence of minimizers in that case, in dimension two, when you have a isosceles rectangular triangle, we can prove that there is no minimizer. And we would like to understand, I mean, there is a there is an open, pro I mean, there are lots of open problems here. We need to understand what happens when you have more general uh, domains, which are not smooth, and that they have, say, different corners. We don't know the general case in particular for the square, for the, for the square in two dimensions, we believe, based on numerical evidence, that there are no solution minimizers for this quantity, but we, we cannot prove it. Uh, I'm going to skip that because that, that's the that's the motivation. I'm the motivation. sorry, may, may I may I interrupt? Ah, it's, yeah? it's it's Hugo. So do you have other sets where you have non-existence? It's it's no, no, it's I'm curious that no. you very specific rectangular uh, triangle. So it's, no, uh, the, the, the only yeah, no, sorry, yeah, it's a shame, but the only case we, where we can are certain that we don't have existence of solutions when we have non-existence is the isosceles uh, right triangle, uh, and yeah, not yeah. even in, in and in the case when when you ah no, the, the, sorry, I'm I'm lying. There is another case which is trivial when you don't have symmetry, uh, geometry. Sorry, in the case of one dimension. When you consider mm -hmm. the one-dimensional case, so, so you have only one interval, so that would be like a, like a hypercube in dimension one, which is trivial. Mm -hmm. In that case, you also uh, don't have non-existence. So we have two cases when you, are, you when you don't have non-existence: the, the 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 interval is zero mm -hmm. one in one dimension. Then then it's easy to prove that there is no solution. And in, and in two dimensions, the case of the social right triangle. And these are the only cases we, we, yeah, it's, where, it's, where we it's honest. curious. It's, uh, thank you. Yeah. And I, I would die, I mean, I would die to know what happens in the square. I mean, <laughs> for the square, uh, based on numerical evidence, which is not very strong, uh, uh, we, we believe that there are no solutions in that case. And But if, if you have a hypercube in dimension, bigger than or equal to 10, we can prove that there is a solution. Not even with other kinds of triangles. You don't know what. Yeah, happens. yeah, yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. And the, the, the method we use in order to prove uh, uh, solutions is against the concentration compactness. So if you have a, a, a domain like a, a rectangle here. Uh, uh, we can always, uh, if you call G the solution to the the gagliardo nierbeck inequalities in the whole domain, you can put the solution in the whole domain and concentrate it in the corner here. And in, in general, you can prove that the this is sort of like a rectangle or, a, or, or if you want a cube in that case. So you can prove that, you, I mean, you can prove in general that the quotient the, the, the best constant in the case of the cube or the rectangle is always bigger than G of N over four. That's easy to prove using concentration in the point. And, and you can prove that if you want, ex, in order to prove that there is exist, existence of solution inside the cube or the rectangle, you have to prove that this is strictly less than that quantity. That, that would be the equivalent of the Brazil's lead in inequality. And uh, so, and, and that's what we do. I mean, in, in general, for a hypercube in dimension big enough, we, we can prove that there is less than the, the, this quantity and we're done. And as, as I said before, in one dimension, we have this quantity here and the infimum is not attained. So this is one case of non-existence.
Yeah. And in dimension in any bigger or equal to two, we have a minimizer. A minimizer for G doesn't exist when you have equality and exists when you have a strict inequality. And then you use concentration compactness. But the concentration here occurs at the boundary. And in order to prove the, the result of existence for a smooth domain, what you use here is a, you can prove that you are going to be, have a solution. You pass, I mean, this is your domain, the boundary of your domain, and we amplify, we sort of like pick a point here where the, the, the point is, where, where you have a, a, here smoothness, and you amplify it, when you have a, an amplifier there, and if you are very close to the, the, this point, the, the boundary of the domain looks like a hyperplane. And we compare, so we compare G of omega with the G of the hyperplane. And this quantity here is given by that. I mean, you, you can have this, the, you can plug in, in here the, the solution to the precise Nuremberg problem in the whole domain concentrated at, at this point. And, and so in order for the minimizer for that to exist, uh, you, you have to use concentration compactness and you have to prove that you have a, a, a trial function that satisfies that this is strictly less than that quantity. And that's a, and then you have to work pretty hard to prove that because there are two things that compete, the, re, the, the structure of the boundary here and the properties of the minimizer of the Bresis near the, the Galeano near inequality. So, it, it, I mean, the, the, the basic idea is very simple but the work you have to do is is complicated i mean you have to uh, again i mean you have concentration you have a small parameter like the epsilon parameter that we had in the in the directly case and then you have to expand expand everything when epsilon in turn around epsilon equals zero and the first case the, the epsilon zero term is precisely this quantity here and then you have to consider the the first non i mean the, the first correction and the first correction has to be negative. And that's a lot of work, but, but at the end you succeed. So if the domain is, is smooth, then we can prove existence by, by exhibiting, by choosing the concentration in a point like that. Uh, and as I said before, in this socialist triangle, there are no minimizers for the Poincare sovereign inequality and, and, this quant and the best constant here is equal to that. And the, the proof, I mean, I'm not going to give you the whole proof of non-existence, but essentially you, you do it by contradiction. You have this social triangle here, and then uh, you have a, suppose you have a, a, a minimizer for, for an, ex, I mean, a, a, an optimizer for that quantity, you call it U. And now you draw the, the, the height here, the, 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 the straight line perpendicular to the, hypo, the, the, the hypotenusa. And then you express it as you, you separate it in a symmetric part uh, around this quantity, in, in, around this, this line here. You call it US, the symmetric part, and the anti symmetric part. And obviously, the, uh, the, the, uh, we are requesting the, the average of U to be zero. The average of the anti symmetric part is obviously zero. So if you impose that the interval of U is zero, uh, since we know that the U of A, by definition, the anti-symmetric part is going to be zero, then the, the symmetric part is also going to have zero average. And, and the symmetric part is uh, going to be a trial function in this little triangle, which is isomor I mean, which is homothetical to the previous thing. And then you use, homot oh, uh, uh, you, use you estimate the quotient in this little thing, and since you have invariance and their scaling, uh, uh, then uh, it is, you can use the invariance and the scaling and also the, the optimizer and you get a contradiction. So that's, uh, it's a very particular proof that, that we use and we cannot use it in general for other domains. And the, the last thing that I'm going to mention is that if you have a rectangle uh, of, of, of with the aspect ratio B, and if B is very large or very small, which is the same because we have this quantity here. So if B is less or equal to 2.12, and then so you have an elongated rectangle, 
then for all b bigger than bc there there are minimizers for the Poincare sobel inequality so in, in the case of elongated rectangles you have existence and also if you if the domain of uh, omega n is the hypercube so you have corners also but if the dimension is very large the dimension very large is bigger or equal to 10 then we have minimizers and the last thing i want to mention i'm like at it's five minutes from the time now is the case when you have uh, inequalities of this sort, but with Dirichlet boundary, Dirichle boundary conditions. So you can consider the same problem, but uh, 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 the Galeardo Nirenberg problem with Dirichlet boundary conditions. And in this case, using uh, the Virial theorem, using the relic pohosaev technique, we can prove that there is no minimizers for this quantity here, as long as omega is star shaped. So what you do is you just you, you use really focusive, I mean you use the or you use the uh, invariance and the scaling, and the and and you treat the, the the boundary of the domain in the with the Adamar technique, and then you can prove that if omega is star shape, there is no minimizer of this quantity. And so that's all I wanted to say. So thank you very much for the opportunity to give this talk here. Thanks a lot. <laughs>